In late July 1859, Emily Beaufort was in Sidon. As a watercolorist herself, she thought Sidon is a place for endless sketching, both within and without the town, and would repay an artist for a stay of some duration. 160 years later, this has been followed up. And now, in this beautiful hammam, with this outstanding exhibition, Sight and Past and Present has been well evoked. This lecture has been planned to add to that by looking at Sidon through the eyes of a selection of past visitors. What it will not discuss is to talk about their views in the light of Edward Said's views on Orientalism, or that of his detractors. This may have to wait. Nor will it include well-known visitors like Hester Stanhope or Lamartine when there is nothing more to say. My choice has been largely determined by the books in my library in England. It includes a businessman, a consul, a countess who founded hospitals in the Near East, an admiral, two artists, and two clergymen. It starts with George Sands, a Jacobean poet who met Fakradin and who was the first to write about Fakradin in the West. It ends with Donald Maxwell, an artist with the Royal Navy at the end of the First World War. George Sands was born in 1578, the youngest son of Edmund Sands, the Anglican Archbishop of York. This family were travellers. Father lived in exile during the reign of Mary Tudor, and an elder brother, Edmund, had journeyed extensively in Europe. George, educated at Oxford, set off in 1610, plainly with a book in mind. His journey took him to Constantinople, Egypt, the Holy Land, and much of the Levant. In this way, he spent some time in Sidon. This was at a time when trading relations between Western Europe and the Ottoman Empire had begun. And of course, the Ottoman Empire was then at its height. That ordinary people had some knowledge of what was going on and of the connections with the East can be shown. This passage from Shakespeare, from Macbeth in fact, first performed in 1606, is an example. Act one, scene three of Macbeth. Here we have the first witch. A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, a roint thee witch, the rump-fed Ronion cries, and then, for our purposes, her husband's to a lepo gone, master of the tiger, which was an Elizabethan merchant ship. There was a demand for more knowledge, and this would be met by George's book, published in 1615, and running to many editions. The author emerges as a serious-minded academic with close attention to detail, his narration constantly interrupted by quotations in Latin with English translations alongside, together with his own poetry. He gets some things wrong, writing, for example, that the Druze are descended from crusaders who stayed behind. George visited Sidon in the early years of Fakradin's rule, whom he appears to have met. He was never known to pray or to be seen in the mosque. Small, great in courage and achievements, subtle as a fox, 
and not a little inclined to the tyrant. Like many visitors, George celebrated the beauty of Sidon, surrounded as it was by fruit orchards and watered by many springs. He noted the inhabitants of sundry nations and religions. He claimed for Sidon to be the birthplace of Boetius, the Roman philosopher, and the place where crystal glass was invented. But he ended on a downbeat note. The town now being is not worth our description, the walls being either fair or of force, the haven decayed, when at best just serving for galleys. At the end of the pier stands a paltry blockhouse, furnished with suitable artillery. The mosque, the banya, that is to say the hammam, and a khan for merchants, the only buildings of note. George's next voyage was across the Atlantic to North America. Along with his brother Edmund and Thomas, he became involved in the London Virginia Company, sailing to Jamestown in 1621. And then in 1624, when Virginia became a crown colony, he became a member of the governing council. In 1631, he returned to England, having been passed over for promotion. He then became a poet, celebrated for his translations of Ovid into English, and wrote extensively on religious subjects, dying unmarried in 1641. We now turn to Le Chevalier d'Avieux, Laurent d'Avieux, born in 1635, began living in Sidon around 1659, when in his mid-twenties. A native of Marseille, he'd gone out to Smyrna, modern Izmir, when 18, and joined his cousins, the Bertrandiers, who were Levantine merchants. One of them then went to Sidon as the company's agent, and Laurent went with him. He recorded his years in Sidon in his memoirs, published posthumously. This is an illuminating account of life in the French Echelle in the 1660s. Laurent himself comes across as a convivial, open-minded, witty man, a bon viveur who perhaps did not attend to his business activities as he should have done. But instead, he learned Arabic, Turkish, Persian, Hebrew, and Syriac, and traveled widely. In the 50 years since George Sand's visit, there had been important changes. Sands recorded the trading companies as predominantly English, but who wanted to leave on account of the extortionate practices of Fakhradin. Now they'd gone, and so at Fakhradin. In their place, France now had a trading monopoly, and there was now some 60 French merchants from Marseille and Lyon exporting cotton and silk and importing money and French goods. Ottoman government had resumed, and extortion was worse than ever. Harbour facilities were non-existent, and ships used to anchor in the lee of the offshore island of Zire, a favourite rendezvous for fishing parties and picnics amongst the French colonies. No one took any interest in classical archaeology, although you only had to put a spade in the ground to find something interesting. Laurent found life in Sidon cheap and exceeding commodious. Game was plentiful. The Turks put no obstacle in the way of shooting, and there were ample supplies of good vegetables and fruit, including bananas. Best of all, the local grapes produced an excellent white wine, strong but very delicate, which kept admirably. 
Davia had occasionally spent a night in a calm before coming finally to Sidon. But it was a Sidon that he made his home in one for the first time, and this way of life delighted him. I established myself where I had the whole front facing the sea, and I spent some money on making the place comfortable. I had a large room and study for myself, a room for my friends, another for my servants, a balcony opening onto the courtyard, a dining room and a kitchen. I was quite at my ease, away from the continual noise. I was the master of my little Khan, whose concierge was entirely at my disposal. I could entertain, study, and work without being interrupted. Two big storerooms served me as a greenhouse, wine cellar, and stable. In a word, I was perfectly lodged, as well as I could wish to be. He goes on. Game of all sorts is plentiful. Every Frenchman, without exception, takes pleasure in going hunting. He comments also on the excellent and varied variety of local fruit and the local grapes, and of course the wine. Some of his colleagues had converted their ground floor stores into cabarets or bars frequented by sailors. And when a new consul arrived, the local worthies all participated in the welcoming procession. However, the extortionate practices of the locals ran the echelons seriously into debt, and this hit Lawrence hard. In addition, he lost two valuable cargoes to pirates, always a menace. So he returned to Marseille. He then pursued an important diplomatic career in the Ottoman Empire. First of all, Algiers and Constantinople, and finally Aleppo as the French consul. He was also involved later on in the production of Le Bourgeois Gentium, advising Molière and Lully on Turkish scenes. He died in Marseille in 1702. Not long after Davia left Aleppo for Marseille, a young English clergyman became chaplain to the English factory at Aleppo. This was Henry Mondrel, a scholar and fellow of Exeter College, Oxford, and then an Anglican curate. His appointment may have been due to the influence of his uncle, Sir William Hedges, one-time director of the Levantine Company's factory at Constantinople. Henry had not long arrived, and in poor health, when in 1697, 14 of the merchants at the factory invited him to join them on their Easter pilgrimage to Jerusalem. He kept a detailed and objective record of their journey, which he sent to friends in England. They persuaded him to publish. The book, entitled Journey from Aleppo to Jerusalem at Easter 1697, was published in 1703. The publisher described this tightly organized, factually precise work, full of detail and illustrations of the classical sites along the way, as a supplement to Sands. Sadly, the author had already died from ill health before the book was published. He comes across as a scholarly, austere man, without the geniality of Davia, and rather too ready to find fault. The party reached Sidon on Friday, March the 19th, 1697. Some of the French merchants, from what Henry describes as their most considerable factory in the Levant, came out to welcome them. They then put up their tents by a cistern outside the walls, but the Frenchmen insisted that they stayed with them in the Khan, which they did. Henry describes the castle of St. Louis, not mentioned by Sands, and from him we get an explanation of the useless harbour 
Fakradin had destroyed the harbour. He destroyed, he destroyed the harbour mole to prevent entry by unwelcome Turkish galleys. Mondral went on to repeat Sand's error of the origins of the Druze descending from the Crusaders. The party had to leave in haste the following day to catch up with the French consul's party. On the way to Tyre, Henry found a Roman milestone. Another one was discovered subsequently, dating from the reign of Septimus Severus, that is to say about 200 AD. This book was in demand and ran to seven editions, the last in 1749. A year after the publication of Mondral's book, Richard Pocock was born into a wealthy family with a strong ecclesiastical connection. After graduating from Oxford in 1725, he received a number of Anglican church appointments in Ireland, but it was not until 1745, on his appointment as chaplain to the Lord Lieutenant, that he went to live there. Meanwhile, he travelled. First, he went to France and Italy, and then in 1737 to Central and Eastern Europe. At this stage, his travelling companion was recalled, and so he went on alone to Egypt and the Near East. It was then that he passed through Sidon on his way north. His account of his travels was published in two folio volumes in 1745. Volume 1 on Egypt has established his reputation as an important early Egyptologist. Pocock visited Sidon approximately 50 years after Maundrell. Nothing, however, was much changed. He made a note of the Roman milestone, repeated the error about the origin of the Druze, and attributed the destruction of the harbour to Fakradine, and said he destroyed other harbours too, including that of Beirut, to prevent a Turkish attack by sea. He carried out a close inspection of the land castle and found earlier walls and a tower which he thought were Byzantine. There were a great number of new, well-built houses. The French still controlled trade in cotton, silk and corn and lived by order of the French consul in the Khan. Various holy orders had their convents there too. Pocock stayed with the Order of the Holy Sepulchre in great comfort. He writes that he received great civilities from the French merchants, and I was one day entertained by them with a collation and a garden under the shade of apricot trees, and the fruit of them was shook on us as an example of their great plenty and abundance. After five years of travel, Pocock returned. In 1756, he was appointed to an Irish bishopric, which meant a great grand style of living with nothing much to do, since the diocese was almost entirely Catholic. So he continued to travel, this time in the British Isles, until his death in 1765. In that year, no doubt to do with an acrimonious dispute, he was subject to an attack on his integrity in an anonymous pamphlet entitled Meekness and Ambition, the Hypocrite Detected, in a dialogue between Richard, an Irish bishop, and Susan, a favourite chambermaid. Pocock, though, was unmarried. There is a living memorial to him at Arbracken, Ireland, where he died. It is a cedar of Lebanon, grown from seeds he collected in Lebanon and planted in the garden of his residence. And a nice glimpse of how he was seen by in smart society is shown in a letter from one of the leading women of the day, Mrs. Elizabeth Montague. This is one that she wrote to a friend after Christmas in 1750. We have a loss 
in not having Dr. Pocock here this Christmas. As we expect, the conversation of men of letters and a traveller is very agreeable in the country. Now I am out of the sphere of attraction of the great city of London, I am as well pleased to hear of some custom at Constantinople as of a new fashion in London, and the Nile is as much in my thoughts as the Thames. Some 100 years later, in August 1838, the Scottish artist David Roberts set out for Egypt, having been persuaded to become a full-time artist by J.M.W. Turner. Roberts was born in humble circumstances in Edinburgh in 1796, and at the age of 10 was apprenticed to a house painter and decorator. He went on to get a job as a scenery painter with a circus, studying art in the evenings. Until his 40s, he continued to paint theatre scenery and work in private houses. But he started to have some success as a landscape artist, especially after a tour of Spain and Tangier. After Egypt, Roberts went on to Palestine and the Levant and passed through Sidon. There, these romanticising views, in my view, show Turner's influence. With picture like these, his reputation was made and his work became widely known through lithographs. He received the freedom of the city of Edinburgh. Queen Victoria gave him support and he became a royal academician. His only other work abroad was in Italy. He was working on views of London when he died suddenly in 1864. I'm going to talk about the Comtesse de Pertuis next, out of chronological order, because of her association with the creative arts. At the same time, I can mention her son Edmund, who was responsible for the road from Beirut to Damascus and closely associated with the railway between the two cities and the construction of the port of Beirut. We've now reached the age of steam and the expansion of Beirut at the expense of Sidon. Elise de Petries visited Sidon in May 1854, according to her journal, which was discovered and published by Monsieur Fouad Debas in 2007. She was born in Hanover in 1800, the daughter of Georg von Grote, a German aristocrat. Her family moved to Paris, where she married Colonel Léon Aimable de Petri, a royalist and a member of Parisian aristocratic society. Her salon was famous. Mendelssohn, Chopin and Georges Sand frequented it. Chopin dedicated his third piano sonata to her. visit to Sidon was a family visit. She'd gone on a visit to Lebanon and she associated largely with people of her own social level. She was on her way back from Jerusalem when she reached Sidon. Not far from Sarepta, her party picnicked in the shade of a fine tree overlooking the pretty town of Sidon hidden by large bunches of fruit trees, especially immense apricot trees, of which the fruit is renowned throughout the country. Soon her party traversed this well-watered town, which appeared charming. She wanted to have a good look the following day, but unfortunately this didn't happen because Edmond de Pertuis failed to keep an arrangement and didn't turn up. So sadly, there is no further entry 
which is a pity because her powers of observation were very good. Now we turn the clock back to 1840 and meet a very different type of visitor to Sidon with a very different purpose in mind. He is Commodore Charles Napier. By 1840, the Ottoman Empire was in sharp decline and interference by the great powers had begun. The Eastern question was with us. At that time, the Viceroy of Egypt, Mehmet Ali, and his son Ibrahim Pasha had been in control of Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine for 10 years. Military action to remove them by the Ottomans had failed. There was mounting civil unrest. So Britain, Austria, and Russia decided to remove them, and a fleet, together with Marines and Turkish soldiery, was sent to the Levantine coast. It was commanded by Napier. Charles Napier, born in 1786, went to sea at 15, saw much action in the Napoleonic Wars, was wounded twice, and subsequently became commander-in-chief of the Portuguese Navy. Known as Mad Charlie for his eccentricities, Dirty Charlie because of his slovenly dress, or Black Charlie for his saturnine countenance, he sat as a Liberal Member of Parliament in the British Parliament, where he campaigned for better conditions for sailors. He was also active in persuading the Admiralty to replace sail with ironclad steamships. His fleet, having defeated Ibrahim Pasha north of Beirut, attacked his forces again at Sidon. After a heavy bombardment, his troops went ashore and after two days drove the Egyptian forces south to Acre and thence back to Egypt. Napier was later appointed an admiral, knighted, and commanded the Baltic fleet in the Crimean War. But in the meantime, he designed a steam frigate, which was built and saw action in the Black Sea. It was called Sidon. The name stuck in the Royal Navy, and the last vessel which bore the name was a submarine, launched in 1944. The Honourable Frederick Walpole may well have served as a lieutenant under Napier in 1840. In his writings, he speaks of his ship moored at Beirut for some time. He used the opportunity to learn Arabic and he certainly made a number of lasting friendships. He was back in Beirut in 1850 at the beginning of a long exploration of the Levant and the Middle East. This was published the following year in these volumes called somewhat misleadingly The Ansari or Assassins with Travels in the Further East. He spent little time in assassin country, but when in Beirut, he looked up his old friends and that's what took him to sight. Perhaps it's important to state at this stage that of all the travelers of whom I speak, Walpole was the one who became friends with local people and understood their ways and their cultures and made it his business to learn about Islam. He also heard when in Sidon that Ibrahim Pasha had planned to make Sidon his capital city. Walpole rode on horseback along the beach, arriving at nightfall. He was barked at by dogs, the dogs of Sidon, and the gates were opened with a silver key for him. And I was soon in the arms of one of my best and dearest friends. Time has a little played with his hair, but spared with pitying hand his truly beautiful wife. No change was in her. Ten years before, she was as now. A mattress was spread on the floor of the living room for him. His sleep was interrupted by the call to prayer, sung in a beautiful voice. Walpole then took the trouble to find out the identity of the singer, and he discovered that he was a calico dyer. The following pages show Walpole 
acutely aware of Islam and very knowledgeable about it. During his stay, he noted and no doubt visited the French Khan, several old mosques and the fine baths. He may well have come here to the Hammam where the exhibition takes place. He visited an old servant of Lady Hester Sanop and tried to buy, unsuccessfully, one of her ladyship's initial teacups and saucers from her. He also inspected the stud of the exiled Emir Bashir and admired his horses. His travelling days over, Walpole retired from the Navy with the rank of commander, married, settled down in his native county of Norfolk, where he was a direct descendant of Sir Robert Walpole, the British Prime Minister in the 18th century, wrote a romantic novel and became a Member of Parliament. He seems to have been a charming man, dying at the age of 54 in 1876. In the 1850s, the British Consul at uh, Jerusalem was James Finn, a remarkable man who founded the Jerusalem Literary Society and did much charitable work, especially among poor Jews. He had overall responsibility for the vice consulate at Sidon and visited the town twice in the course of his duties. He kept a detailed account of his time in Jerusalem and this was edited and published after his death by his widow with a foreword by our next visitor, Emily Beaufort. The work is called Stirring Times, as indeed they were. His first visit was in 1853. Customs officials were corruptly charging an extortionate export duty on tobacco exports, Sidon's principal export at the time, and Finn put an end to that, becoming at the time, a local hero in the town. His second visit coincided with the fall of Sevastopol in the Crimean War. He was staying with his vice consul and witnessed the celebrations. The minarets and the governor's house were all illuminated with lamps. The bazaars were thronged and the shops stayed open, bedecked with showy goods and gay with bright lamps with musicians posted at street corners. On Sunday, there was a grand Muslim procession in which some Jews and Christians also joined. It was headed by a man carrying the town's banner of green and white. This was followed at night by a torch-lit procession in which boys sang, men fired guns, followed by a float illustrating the silk-weaving traditions of the town. Finn also heard about the discovery of the tomb of Ekmanaza II and its fate. His vice-consul told him he had found it in the gardens, but that it lay partly in that belonging to the French consul. Both claimed it. An inquiry in Beirut found in favour of France a French frigate immediately appeared, and off it went. It has been in the Louvre ever since. We now come to Emily Beaufort, who we've already come across twice already. Emily was the youngest daughter of Admiral Sir Francis Beaufort, chief hydrographer of the Royal Navy, and now remembered for the Beaufort scale for the measurement of wind force. He was also responsible for arranging for Charles Darwin's voyage on the Beagle. Emily was probably educated at home, plainly an, an intellectually stimulating environment. She comes across as a gifted writer with a tendency towards purple prose, an accomplished watercolorist and a very moderate poet. She was energetic and resourceful and an excellent shot with a strong sense of public duty. She was of Huguenot descent on both sides of her family. Now she and her sister Rosalind decided to travel to the East after the death of her widowed father in 1858. She was then unmarried. 
in her late thirties. They called themselves the Wandering Maidens. First stop was Egypt, where cruising up the Nile, their boat and all their belongings in it were destroyed by fire. But they reached Beirut by sea via Smyrna and settled in rented accommodation at Bait Mary. In August 1859, with some friends, they decided to ride to Sidon by moonlight. I'm now going to read Emily's description of Sidon from her book, Egyptian Sepulchres and Syrian Shrines. Another mile or so brought us to the brow of the last headland and to our first view of Sidon, and a lovely view it was. There she sat at the edge of the deep blue water, pale brown and purple mountains embracing her in warm giant arms with battlemented walls and towers round her, all white and glistening in the early sunshine, like a swan sitting by the seashore or a white dove resting on the crest of the cliff. We turned down to the beach and continued our road on the soft slushy sand along the edge of the waves, sometimes stopping to pick up some particularly pretty shell, oftener to watch the colours of the last foam that trembles on the sand with rainbow hues from the bright morning sun. The view grew prettier and prettier as we distinguished the high castle above the town built by Louis XI of France and the other fortress standing on rocks which run far out into the sea and are connected with the shore by a low bridge of nine arches. We entered the town about 8 a.m. and wound through the narrow streets and gay bazaars and still gayer, thriving-looking people in bright, clean dresses to the houses of Signor Santi, where we were soon established in a pleasant saloon furnished with divans and mats. One expects nothing more in an Arab reception room unless it be a tray of pipes and nargiles. The heat and the mosquitoes drove away all thoughts or hopes of sleep and we could only lie still and pant till the cool breeze of the sunset hour enabled us to visit some hospitable French Arabs living in the French Cartier or Khan, as it is called, a huge building as large as a London square, erected by the Emir Fakhreddin for the use of French merchants in the 17th century. A large tank and fountain occupy the centre of the court in a garden of bananas, acacia and lemon trees, which made the evening breeze come into the apartments laden with perfumes. Each family has its own suite of rooms, communicating with the rest by a wide corridor extending round the court on both stories to walk and lounge in. It seemed to us a most pleasant residence, with a promenade on the housetop where one can enjoy fresh breezes and lovely views of the city. Saida is one of the prettiest towns in Syria. The mosque and baths are particularly picturesque and almost handsome. The two castles and the fine rocks with the breakers constantly dashing over them, and the rich fruit garden all around the city form a most charming tout ensemble. The view from the Chateau of Saint-Louis is equally pretty and more extensive. The headland of Sur, the ancient Tyre, bounding the scene. This castle is kept in good repair and was originally a strong fortress. That on the rocks, is very much shattered, but worth seeing. On her return to Bait Mary, she witnessed a violent clash between Maronite and Druze. She wasn't frightened, but must have felt powerless to help the wounded and bereaved. She continued exploring the Levant and was clearly entranced by people and landscape. I believe the rest of her life was shaped by these reactions. The account of her travels 
Egyptian sepulchres and Syrian shrines, came out in 1861 and was well received with one exception. An anonymous reviewer in the Saturday Review, but she tracked the reviewer down and carried out a vigorous confrontation with him. He turned out to be the 8th Viscount Strangford, a retired diplomat and philologist, but sickly, reclusive and single. Three months later, they were married. Seven years later, after much travel in Albania and Montenegro and Dalmatia, she was widowed. But she then qualified as a nurse and spent the rest of her life founding hospitals in Bulgaria and Egypt. She was on her way to Port Said to found another one when she died suddenly at sea at the age of 62. She was awarded the Red Cross by Queen Victoria for establishing the Royal Victorian Hospital in Cairo. Interestingly, after the uprising of Arabi Pasha and his defeat in battle, uh, this hospital was equally available to heal the wounded of the Egyptian army as well as those of the British army, which I think says a lot for her as a very open-minded individual whose concern was healing the sick, uh, whatever their origins or wherever they'd come from. Our last artist is Donald Maxwell. And here is a view of Sidon at daybreak in November 1918. It was painted from the deck of a North Sea trawler called Liberty, requisitioned by the British Admiralty. The artist, Donald Maxwell, had been well known for his travel books, uh, written and illustrated by himself. His reputation was well established and in fact, he'd been in Lebanon once before. So he was a natural choice for a war artist and was called up into the Navy. Unfortunately, the war was over before he arrived in the Levant. Maxwell has captured a scene that many visitors would have known well. But the motorboats, I think, give an ominous note. Alan Bizarmi had received a warm welcome in the town and had gone on to Beirut. But as Maxwell knew, famine stalked the land. But much has changed in the last hundred years. And this would be a good subject for another talk. What I have endeavoured to do is to look at Sidon between Fakhradin and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and to tell you something of the visitors. I believe that this beautiful Haman, lovingly restored, and this remarkable exhibition say something profound to us. They tell us of the traditional life and values of this town, which our visitors found here, and express a continuity by linking the past to the present and, one likes to think, gives one hope for the future.